Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and today I am joined by the one, the only, everyone's favorite, Ryan Pryor. He's here. <laughs> He's there. He's every F and where. Yeah. Ryan Pryor. Do you know what that's from? I'm going to guess an Ole Miss chant. No, it's Ted Lasso. Have you oh, watched Ted Lasso? Oh, I haven't Lasso? watched Ted Lasso. No. You gotta, every, oh, my God. You have told, to watch it. I've been told at least 17 times within the last you have. three days. You want to know why? To watch it. it might be the greatest show ever made. Like, oh. it is so good. See, I have this thing, okay? I've been told so many times to watch the show, and it's not that I'm the kind of person that's like, oh, because everybody loves it, I don't want to watch it. But with this one, I kind of am a little bit. It looks cheesy to me. No, nope, it it's is not... so good. You have to watch it. You and you and the hubbo will, will adore it. It is a perfect, like, Friday night show. It is so good. Well, we're not in listen, you season three right you now. You know that Caroline and I are not trendy folk. We don't follow the trends. We like to we like to to toot to the beat of our own horn. Oh, that's a new uh phrase. I'm gonna toot to, that, that's the episode title. Just kidding. Toot to the beat <laughs> Actually, of our own that horn. Kind of works. I don't know. <laughs> I, we so when and I'm gonna tell you we kept telling people keep saying oh Ted Lasso and we were like no 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 mm-hmm. we're not gonna watch Ted Lasso not gonna watch Ted Lasso and then finally we're like screw it we gotta watch Ted Lasso and uh, so good it's amazing it's an incredible show it deserves all the Emmys all of the Emmy awards well as, here's the thing I have so many shows going right now I'm watching you season three do y'all watch okay. that or no no oh it's so good drop and that and drop no, it and listen, go to Ted no Lasso. I have to finish that but we're almost, we'll be done with it by like tomorrow the next day I'm watching this is us we'll come back soon enough and then I'm, I'm watching million little things every week I'm watching American Crime Story Impeachment which are you watching that no and you call yourself a history guy. It's ridiculous. That's so, pop history. I have a I have degrees. I don't need to watch pop history. Well, I, I hate to break it to you, but you're kind of on a pop history podcast. So. I know. I come down here to make sure that your show has a little class every <laughs> once in a while. Yeah, they, thank you for your ministry. I appreciate you're it. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh, man. But anyway, all this to say, I have a lot of shows going on. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. We're in the middle of a four-part reunion, and it's it's getting Oh, intense. it's getting raunchy, I'm sure. No, intense. Oh. Erica, well, Girardi. Okay. Long speaking story. of intense, I have some great, we have some great intense stuff tonight. Wow. For this good. show. Yeah. That was a good uh, lead. And so we're going to start with the prelude. Prelude. Nailed it. I just, I just in my head, I heard the little. I did too. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So we're talking tonight. What are we talking about, Allison? You, you're the host. Okay. I wanted to talk about JFK's stance on Vietnam and the war in Vietnam and what he did with it. All that. And the then whole on top thing. Of it, yeah, the Vietnam. whole shebang. And then I wanted to talk about his foreign policy in general and his beliefs in that. And I did some reading on all of this. So I'm a little well-versed on this topic. If you are well-versed, I'm going to tell the story of Vietnam and then maybe you can then add the context of, of Kennedy's foreign policy beliefs and feelings. We'll Um, see. We'll see. We got to start in the summer. We're going to start and we're going to do like a cool movie, like a cool movie or a TV show. We're going to start at one point and then we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back in time and we're going to tell a story from two different angles. Love it. Um, So it's the summer of 1963. Picture it. Americans were turning on their televisions and what they were seeing were images of Buddhists protesting in the streets of Saigon, which is the capital of South Vietnam, which at the time was the country. We'll talk about that in a minute. Specifically, they were protesting the Diem government, which was a military dictatorship, basically, that ruled South Vietnam. You see, the Kennedy administration and the United States had an official public stance that supported the Diem administration. But there was a problem. You see, the Diem administration, and I might be pronouncing this poorly, I'm not great with Vietnamese names, so I apologize in advance if I'm butchering the names, uh, because they are, they can be tricky, at least for me to pronounce, so I do apologize about that. The problem was this. On the one hand, the Americans were watching this pro- this Buddhist protest go on in South Vietnam, and they didn't like what they saw. And they weren't super thrilled with the United States' unabashed support of this particular military dictatorship. You see, the United States and people of the United States have often had one singular issue, and that is a conscience. We want things to go the way that we want them, but when we see them in front of us, we have a really hard time accepting it. And so 
Uh, in this particular case, the Kennedy administration's support of DM was causing them some very heavy political strains, and they were also causing some, again, questions of morality and ethics. But on the other hand, you have the problem of domino theory. Domino theory being uh, something that pretty much defined the 1950s and defined the 1960s. Pause here. Caroline's calling me. Mm -hmm. Hey, baby, what's up? I'm I'm uh, I'm podcasting with Allison. Okay. Then bye, I guess. Are you are you coming home? I was asking you if I needed to, but I'm just going to not. I have all of the supplies for stuff. That's that's great. I I guess you don't want me to make dinner right now. If you need to finish your work, that is just fine. Bye. I love you. Allison says hello. She loves you. When are you going to be home? Tell Allison hello. Um I'm not sure soon, maybe not soon. Okay. If you don't, I if you're not her. home soon, it's, if you're not <laughs> home soon, I'll probably take a bath. So please don't scare me when you come in. Oh my god. Okay, I'm just gonna finish this. All right, finish it and come home. Bye now. We have what we do in the shadows to watch. All right, love you. Love you. Bye. Domino theory. You might remember. You remember we talked about this in a previous episode, specifically about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. We were talking about domino theory. I don't remember that part of that episode, but I do know domino, what domino theory just, is. <laughs> just, 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 you know, know, you know what domino theory is, right? Yeah. So the prevailing, the prevailing attitude after World War II that if one country fell to communism, the ones next to it would fall to communism, right. and all of a sudden you'd have a communist world. Um, and so the Kennedy administration was kind of stuck, um, and that's where that's where we're going to begin our story. We're going to have to go back in time to figure out why the Kennedy administration became stuck in a, in a really untenable situation. Um, you know, Vietnam, comparatively speaking, in terms of like the Vietnam spanned the course of three different, no, four different U.S. presidents, jo Eisenhower, Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Uh, technically, if you want to get to brass tacks, it's five. Four, two, right? So five presidents, if you want to consider the fact that in 1975 was when we finally, finally got out of Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so, it's, I mean, again, Vietnam and then like Afghanistan is another example, right? The modern, like Afghanistan is the modern day Vietnam, right? Afghanistan mm -hmm. was under four different presidents. And we can talk all day long about um, the, the geopolitical implications of staying in a, a year, a war for 20 years. So we got to go back in time and thus we have to end the prelude. Prelude. And make our way to the interlude. Interlude. I think you formulate these episodes just to use those sound bites so they'll work perfectly. <laughs> I might or might not. That is a <laughs> that is speculation the of the highest order. I plead the fifth. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's get into it. Allison. Mm-hmm. Before Vietnam or South Vietnam and North Vietnam were independent countries, who controlled them colonially? What? It was France. The French, before Vietnam was called Vietnam, not even before, it was called Vietnam, and then of course colonialism happened, which is not a positive thing, uh, and it was then known as French Indochina. That was the terminology that was used for Vietnam. And so after World War II, the French tried basically to reestablish their colonial control over Vietnam. Over the course of Nine years, the French fought with uh, with the the South Vietnamese, with the Vietnamese in general, and were eventually defeated in 1954. After uh, you may have heard of the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, but I'm sure you have. It's a pretty famous interaction. The, the Vietnamese were able to defeat the the French by carrying artillery pieces through the mountains uh, up and around a town. It took them months to do so, and then they destroyed the town and, and beat the French. Probably one of the best examples of how we could have predicted what was going to happen whenever we and ourselves invaded Vietnam, but that's neither here nor there. And so the 1954 Geneva Accords, uh, a different Geneva Accords, not the, not some, there's, a, there's been many different Geneva Accords, basically created two countries, North Vietnam, which was a communist country, and South Vietnam, which was a non-communist country, run by a military dictatorship of, and again, I want to make sure I pronounce this correctly, it's, the name is No Din Diem. It is spelled N-G-O space D-I-N-H space D-I-E-M. So if you have any Vietnamese listeners or people who are familiar with the Vietnamese language and your podcast and I pronounce that poorly, please let them know to send you a, a message and I will be happy to retract I'm going to insert a sound clip right here of the proper pronunciation. No, ding, damn. And so basically, the United States helped support this military dictatorship because they were afraid of democracy, 
wait a minute, what? Afraid of democracy, you say? Yes, we were afraid of democracy. Why might we be afraid of democracy in South Vietnam? Okay, I don't know. Stop asking me this question. What if they all got together and voted and they voted to become communist? Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that would be bad. Well, at least at the time they thought it would be bad. But what they didn't want was the South Vietnamese people getting together and vote to join North Vietnam. So basically, we decided to support a military dictatorship in order to stop the spread of communism throughout the country. I personally, uh, from a personal stance, believe that the best defense against communism is to let countries become communists and then fail 50 years later and understand why capitalism is a far superior system. But Mm. that's just me. There is no such thing, and this is not an economics podcast, but there is no such thing as a good economic system because the entirety of economics is based off of scarcity. That's why we have economic systems to begin with because I, because certain resources are scarce. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Well, uh, I'm going to start a new little soundbite and I want you to create it right now and it's going to be Ryan Pryor's opinions. So I want you to kind of sing it in whatever way that you, w- you would like <laughs> or we'll create a jingle. Okay. That is my opinion. Excellent vocals. All right, continue. <laughs> Anyway, back to the story. So remember, again, we're going to go back to that domino theory thing, that the the entirety of U.S. foreign politics or foreign policy after World War II was based on the containment theory. We had to contain communism wherever it sprouted, and then we had to stop it from spreading and falling like dominoes. Okay? So again, containment theory, domino theory, these are interchangeable terms for our purposes. The Eisenhower administration, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the great famed general of World War II, uh, was the one who began this whole ordeal. And, he seemed to uh, do that a lot. He did, and he did. And he was very worried in, in 1955 that the Vietnamese would vote to join North Vietnam, the South Vietnamese would jo- join North Vietnam. And so this led to the creation of what was called CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. And as a part of the CETO deal, which again was sort of like NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which you might have heard of, mm-hmm. um, the United States sent 700 military personnel to Vietnam as well as significant economic aid. So this was kind of the beginning of this process. Remember, we won't get out of Vietnam until 1975. 1955 to 1975. That's how long American military personnel have been in Vietnam. I don't even want to tell you how long we've had military personnel in South Korea. Um, 70 years, okay? Wow. Um, So in 1961, Kennedy inherited this situation. They had continuously ramped up the number of military personnel, military, we called them advisors, who were being sent to Vietnam. And it had increasingly become a really untenable situation for just a whole lot of reasons. But in May of 1961, JFK authorized us to send 500 more special forces and military advisors to assist the DM administration. So by 1962, there were approximately 11,000 military advisors in in South Vietnam just by itself. And so here we are, 1962. Right. What started with the French trying to recapture Indochina has created a situation where South Vietnam and North Vietnam have basically been in a, been in a state of war for almost 30 years, uh, 20, 20 to 30 years uh, with different foreign powers. And by the way, the South Vietnamese aren't super happy with the DM dictatorship, but they have complete military control and the aid of, and the aid of American money and military power. Meanwhile, you've got Viet Cong, which are South Vietnamese or Vietnamese communists who are consistently trying to foment. And by the way, this is the only word, time and place I think we can use the word foment in the say, world. What does that even mean? It means to like, like create or stoke revolution. And usually it comes with the word revolution. You have Vietnamese communists trying to stoke or foment revolution in South Vietnam. And that combined with the fact that the DM government was corrupt as hell, okay, and divisive because Diem was a devout Roman Catholic and therefore uh, felt that and, and wanted to convert and make the entirety of South Vietnam a Catholic country. And so any religious minority that wasn't Christian or Catholicism was basically treated as uh, second class citizens. They were basically mm-hmm. treated. And this will come into play later on in part two when we begin to talk about the sort of ramping this up. And so here's the situation. We have Kennedy inheriting a situation from a former president which is, again, we can sort of see this in the modern world with Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden, who all inherited an untenable situation in Afghanistan. And remember, 
What was Kennedy's biggest fear, at least in terms of foreign policy? That he was afraid of looking weak on communism. He didn't want to look like a pansy. Like he was already well, sort of- Well, he was scarred from Bay of Pigs so badly right. that he didn't want to- exactly. Yeah. Oh, 100%, scarred from Bay of Pigs. He didn't want to look weak on communism. But at the same time, again, we've got this moral dilemma that the DM government is, in by all accounts, incredibly cruel. And, and TV exists now. Mm -hmm. The advancement, the development of TV, as we often talk about, right? We talked about the election of 1960, you and I have, and the impact that television had on that election. Well, in terms of foreign politics, all anyone had to do was say, Kennedy administration is supporting the DM government, which is mutilating, killing Buddhists in the streets and uh, is, you know, forcing people out of their homes and we're spending money and there are, are militaries over there. What the hell's going on with that? And so this is really one of the more interesting, I think, foreign policy issues when it comes to the Kennedy Kennedy dynasty, the Kennedy administration, as it were, because it, we don't, it doesn't get talked about nearly as much as the Bay of Pigs or the Cuban Missile Crisis by any means, but it might have been, might be the most, like, Kennedy's continual involvement and, and decisions mm -hmm. after what we're going to talk about, I think, in part two, uh, really do set the United States up to be involved in Vietnam for another 12 years and creates what is considered to be one of the most disastrous foreign policy decisions of any American president short of the Spanish-American War or uh, really that. I mean, that's it. Short of the Spanish-American War. Also, I do want to say, too, the different stances of if you think Kennedy may have continued in the War of Vietnam, if you think he would have pulled out, blah, 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 all the things that we don't have answers for because obviously his presidency was tragically cut short so it's just assumptions that's a really highly debated topic that oh it's hugely debated yeah I, in fact so, yeah historians so I'm just saying like anything that is said will be kind of opinion based i think well i think it'll be opinion based but here's the thing objectively speaking because kennedy did continue on what the eisenhower administration was doing he does have a a role in oh, our, in, sure. our in, in in the in the in the united states most disastrous war i think i read earlier somewhere where someone said, though, that he was looking to pull back in 64. Is that true or no? He, I think, I mean, I, I, I think there, there was, there, there, he, it's all he did not want, I think. This, and this is, we're going to talk about this in part two. So I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And we, we can start, we can have a little bit more conversation in part two about the, the would he or wouldn't he have. have. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, I want to, I want to just say that basically what leads Kennedy to sort of begin to step in and what what ends up being the sort of watershed moment of the American involvement in Vietnam is what is called the Buddhist crisis. And that is where we are going to start part two of this episode is the Buddhist crisis, um, which I think is super interesting and is going to be a nice um, opening salvo for your listeners. Perfect. Um, now, do you well. want to talk a little bit more about JFK and foreign policy in this episode, or do you want to push it to the next one? Well, we could talk about the very, like, we could talk a little bit about the beginning. Is there something that you had that you specifically wanted to touch on? Not necessarily. I just think it's important to note that that was something he really focused on, his presidency that he thought was so important. Kennedy, I mean, uh, Kennedy was, was, to be fair, blessed with inheriting a pretty strong economy from the Eisenhower mm -hmm. administration. Domestic issues were largely centered on civil rights, which he, of course, touched on, and he, of course, was in instrumental in. In. But I do think that we have, one has to consider the economic situation of the 1950s, which was probably one of the most prosperous times in American history. Wage growth, job creation, industries growing at exponential rates. Mm -hmm. You really didn't have some of the issue. Like, as a president, the most pressing issue was foreign policy, was the containment of communism, was the battle over ideological differences between the USSR and Americans. And so I really do think that one of the reasons that JFK was able to to make so many of these decisions that impacted, and because most of the things we talk about with JFK are having to do with the Cold War, mm -hmm. um, is because he inherited a very strong ec economic situation. Not for all people. Obviously, we know about from the Mississippi Delta episode, we know that there was plenty of people of color, immigrants, people who were not white, uh, middle class or upper middle class Americans who were doing very poorly. So I do certainly do not want to imply that everyone was doing well. But the at the grand scheme of things, if you're thinking about economics in terms of uh, the aggregate, mm -hmm. then yeah, absolutely. JFK had to focus on Well, he was a Cold War president. Yeah he, yeah, he was he Cold War not. president. He was the Cold War president because yeah. I would Eisenhower and him were the two Cold War presidents. That's the thing. Uh, like Truman was, Truman's whole thing was ending World War II. 
uh, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson's whole presidency was sort of meshed in civil rights in Vietnam, mm-hmm. and and Nixon I, Nixon's entire presidency was was really uh, you know economics and 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 then you know Watergate and. Jimmy Carter dealt with domestic issues. Eisenhower Ford's just kind of in there somewhere. Ford's just kind of in there. <laughs> J- Eisenhower and JFK, and then to some extent Reagan, but Reagan really brought back the Cold War as a way to rally the nation together. Like Reagan, there's some argument to be made that Reagan sort of stoked the Cold War in the 1980s to bring back a common enemy for Americans, mm-hmm. which I think is true to some extent. But th- that's, that's of course, that's political and, and historical speculation. Sure. Uh, there's a quote that I wanted to share. I tried to find the sound bite from it, but it, is, it does not exist. But JFK said in a campaign speech for the Massachusetts State Senate seat in 1951, so this would have been obviously about nine years before his presidency started, uh, he said, foreign policy today, irrespective of what we might wish in its impact on our daily lives, overshadows everything else. Expenditures, taxation, domestic prosperity, the extent of social science all hinge on the basic issue of war or peace. So I think he kind of carried that thought process through. I, I, and I can't sure. say that I disagree with him from a, from a specific, and I want to make sure that this is my personal opinion, right? That is my opinion. We, we live in a, like today, we live in a globalized society. One of the biggest problems that I think, I think one of the most valid criticisms, of, and again, don't, I'm not saying one way or the other, one of the most valid criticisms of the Trump administration was that he was inept when it came to foreign policy. And that, an America first agenda is what every president should be running in the first place, but that we have to exist in a world where we, there used to be this old phrase, like, have you ever heard what's that have to do with the price of tea in China? Mm -hmm. The world we live in today, the price of tea in China matters because if tea goes up in China, then another product will go up halfway around the world because that's how interconnected we are. Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, it just, it's just the way it is. And so I just, I think that JFK realized that before globalization really took hold of the United States. I think that's an incredible like sort of foresight to see that the way that the United States interacts with the world is is the one of the more important things. And that's one of the reasons that that I think that electing a political outsider while it feels good to sort of put a fist up to to um to Washington really is dangerous. Because foreign policy is such an important part of the political process, and the president is the chief diplomat of the United States. And so when you have someone who doesn't know how to do that, who doesn't know how to be a diplomat, who doesn't know how to to do anything but bludgeon their way through, and who can't speak softly and carry a big stick, as my favorite President Theodore Roosevelt would say, then you're going to have problems. Um you know, you're you're just going to have problems, and and I don't want to get into that too specifically, but I think JFK was ahead of his time in in that regard, uh, in in understanding the world as it would exist forty or fifty years later. Totally. All right. Do you want to get some to some questions? I got some questions for you this week. So do we want to answer questions now? We'll yeah, let's split okay. them up. Let's do some okay. in this one, sure. and then we'll do some in the second. For one. sure. So we're halfway through the story, and so we'll 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 pick back up. Yes, we will. Therefore, in answer to your question. A couple of these are for me, a couple for you. Okay, first of all, I want to hit this one. It says, any hints you can provide about your upcoming book? So I don't want to give too much away, as I've said a million times, but I will say a hint about it is I truly believe that the topic will appeal to people who really care about the Kennedys, who really care about American history and politics, but also people that just don't at all. I think that the topic in general will appeal to across the board to a lot of different people. Another hint is that it's written in wingdings. What's a wingding? The font, wingding. The the like the the you know like 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 Times New Roman, it's wingdings. Oh no, it's written in comic sans. For, ah, for fun. No, just just to add that humorous t- No, you're not no, you're a one. You would never do that. I you would, would ab- die. You before would I die. Did that. Do you guys, <laughs> no. by the way, I want to know if your audience is into the Enneagram as much as we are, because I honestly, like one of like Allison is busy all the time because she's, you know, a superstar and I am busy literally all the time. And uh because I'm I, I'm bad at managing my time. But like <laughs> One of our main ways of, you know, adult friendships, it's like, 
Have you ever seen John Mulaney's bit on adult friendships? No, but I love John Mulaney. Well, he, he has a adult on adult friendships, and he's like, all these shows about like adult friends should be called We Haven't Seen Each Other in Six Months, and it's f- fine. It's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> but like, I think Alice and I mostly on a weekly basis communicate through me sending, we send each other Enneagram memes uh-huh. from Instagram. And, and then I we was write like, back, oh my God, that's me. And then that's, oh God, the that's me. Oh my God, that's me. Oh my God, that's me. And then that's it. Or, or something. Or congratulations for yeah. something. But um, you would never write your book in Comma Sans because you're a one and ones don't do that. That's so true. I would never. Would and that, Ryan's a ugh. three. So we yeah, kind of so, get each other. And we do. Because one because a three would never for a different reason. Not because it's not like I would write it in Comic Sans a if it was. Three would never because they would worry about what other people would think about yes, it and that it yes. would diminish the value of, yes, of, of the their book. People would be like, this guy's a this guy's an idiot. Mine would be, like, be it looks no! like shit. I can't do <laughs> yeah. that. Like it has to be perfect. That it has to be perfect. Reason. She's like, I don't care what other people say. I want it this way. And I'd be like, I only care about what other people say. <laughs> exactly. Okay, another okay. question. Another question. Which one do I want to tackle? All right, let's do this one. Has he seen any Kennedy films? This is a two-parter, so answer that. Have you seen any Kennedy-based films? Um, uh, I, I've watched Kennedy-based films. I've watched um, what's the one about the the one that came out just like two years ago about um, Jackie Chappaquiddick. Chappaquiddick. Yeah, I watched Chappaquiddick. I have seen a, uh, a like a TV like a DV like mini series on the Kennedys. Um, oh yeah. But I honestly, guys, here's the thing. I deal with history so much that I really don't watch a lot of like historical, histor- history based like you would think you would. media. I watch, if I watch anything, it's like a documentary. But like the biggest, one of the biggest history movies that's come out in the last like five years has been 1917. You remember that? You know that 1917 mm-hmm. movie? Didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, Jeffrey, I th- is that the one that was, no. Shot yeah, in one continuous. He was shot in, one con- it in like IMAX or something cool. Right. Yeah. He sh- it sh- was shot in one continuous shot which mm-hmm. is a pretty big deal for a for a movie oh yeah and i i don't care you I, know what's I, interesting i just was like how could you not i would think you would but you know what jeffrey my husband is really like he's amazing he like has an emmy he he is a camera guy does all kinds of cool stuff so his profession is to film Humble brag yeah yeah you know well it's not me he's I got an emmy say. he does i'm proud of it it is what it is but uh he you know films professionally but i can't get him to pick up a camera around the house i'm like hey nope. can you take a video of us like i have to remind him because it's like that's that's his work yep. so when you would you think d- he follows our family around with a camera sure. constantly but he doesn't so when you whenever you are whenever you do it for your profession the last thing you want to do is come home and do it at home yeah that's it and I think so, so when you teach history as a profession it's not that i don't love historical things i love going to museums don't get me wrong i love going to museums like i'm a big i'm a well, huge it's museum like a tangible fan. like you're seeing right. something yeah and yeah. it's an experience and I, I love that but like when i come Come home. I mean, the show, guys. I I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not gonna lie to your fans. I'm not gonna lie to Allison. I and she, you wouldn't believe me if I tried to say this. I'm I'm not a very I'm a humble person when it suits me, but I'm I'm pretty full of myself. Um, <laughs> no way. I'm very self confident. Let's put it that way. I'm not full of myself. Yeah, yeah. I'm just very self confident. Yeah. And like I am, I'm a very I'm a, I, I like to I like to think I'm a pretty smart person. But like when I come home, the last thing I want to do is engage in any kind of intelligent kind of like activities. I just mm-hmm. I watch stupid shows like Bob's Burgers and animated television and like Family Guy and <laughs> it's, it's Always Sunny in Philadelphia yeah. uh, and football. And I just want to sit there and I just, I just want to be mindless. I, I hate to say this. I don't watch a lot of media specific uh, in terms of like the Kennedy media. Um, I do not. Uh, I I like to I, now. I do watch so every once in a while. I'll watch, of course, like those. Like CNN does a great '60s documentary, the series on the '60s. Uh, so good. I, and honestly, the, the Kennedy I episode's incredible. I haven't seen a CNN series that was bad. There's a right. Bush years one that's great. The and Kennedy I did, ones is my favorite. And I did watch. I did. To be fair, I did watch a movie that was that had um, that had, was about LBJ. Um, which was pretty Woody good. Woody Harrelson? No, not Woody Harrelson. Uh, it's the most recent one with Brian Cranston, who mm, plays LBJ. Mm-hmm. I did watch that one. That one I've watched that one. I like that one a lot. Um, and I, I will tell you, however, media-wise, JFK's uh, can go play Black Ops, Call of Duty Black Ops from 2011, and you can play as John F. Kennedy fighting zombies. Do you so, want to know something really nerdy about what's me? What's up? I played 
that game in just in just to play school, as JFK. Like J- no, this is like before the fascination even sparked. I-, I had a bunch of dude friends and they played, and I was like, "This is fun." So I got <laughs> it, and I used to play Call of Duty like my junior and senior year of high school. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest bit. It should because who am you're I? not? But you're not a girly girl, is the thing. So yeah, like, it true. doesn't surprise me. I like you clothes. But that's it. Okay, so the second part of that was what's your favorite movie, Kennedy movie? But you can't answer that. And she asked me what mine was too. And mine is Natalie Portman's portrayal of Jackie. I think it's 2018. I think it's the most hauntingly beautiful performance I've seen from someone in a very long time. And I'm really excited for her. I think it's the same director as doing I'm actually going to say, I do have a favorite. Okay. It just features the, the Kennedys for just a little bit. Okay. But it's J. Edgar. The the bio, the Leonardo DiCaprio plays J Edgar Hoover <gasps> and it's a biopic. I didn't know this of, existed. I oh, need to yeah. watch that. It's fantastic. Yeah, and so oh JFK's in it a little bit. The Kennedys are in it a little bit. Um, yeah, for obvious reasons. But uh, but yeah, wow. J, J Edgar is a fantastic film if you haven't seen it. All right, I'm gonna watch that. But I'm gonna continue. I want to I want to finish my spiel on. Jackie oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. So I think everyone needs to see that movie because it's just. I mean, I know that there's some obviously added things to it. It's not 100% accurate, but I just think it's so emotionally spot on. The score even just like brings you, it's it's haunting. It truly is. So what I was saying is I'm really excited for the direct, I think it's the same director is directing the Kristen Stewart movie coming out about Diana. So it's going to be kind of a similar kind of feel about it. Princess Diana. So I'm excited about that. I, also, I, I, Side note, I don't get people's obsession with, with Diana. Oh, I do. I love the Royals, though. I follow that. Them That's. I think we've talked about this before. Closely. I'm not a yeah. just. I'm just not a Diana person. Like I don't. Yeah, I love her. I'm not a royal person to begin with. I do love England. I'm a big. I'm a. I'm a. I I'm think a, you'd have to be into studying the monarchy to. to I'm an really Anglophile for sure. I'm an Anglophile for sure. I just don't get the the monarchy like this. That particular monarchy, the 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 Sax Coburg Gothas, mm-hmm. do don't do anything for me. Oh my gosh, who are you? Like you're born in the wrong time. I much prefer prime ministers of England. Mm-hmm. Churchill, Margaret Thatcher. I love you Margaret Thatcher. You know, JFK really admired Winston Churchill. Who didn't? Well, true. Big admiration for him. I have a question. Okay. If you could be born in any time period, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. And you're asking me, I'm a straight white man. So, Allison, you got to remember something. This is a loaded question. A question that, as we've talked about, we had some great episodes last year about privilege. Sure. And so I've got to quantify this by saying that I could go back just about any, any time, time period yeah. and live a great life. Like, I, I, I'm a literate, straight white man. You took that way more seriously than I figured. I just meant, like, what, well, what do you want to dress no, like? See, what, the problem what do you is, want to the, be? The problem is, is it's a loaded question because... No, I see, not, yeah. It's a loaded question for a person like me because, yeah, for just like a, sitting around drinking a beer talking about it, absolutely. But if we're on a history podcast and talking about it, you do have to acknowledge the fact that, like, I could go back to the 1870s mm-hmm. and it wouldn't be a problem, but you could go back there and you wouldn't be able to vote or own land. Like, true. You know, it's so very true. it's it's it would be it's kind of it's kind of not ignorant to us to to say, but like almost a little bit short sighted for me to say something. But from a purely a purely just a, I would like to experience that time. Sure. 1970s New York. Interesting. Like I would like to be like a 20 year old in the 70s in New York. There's so much turmoil in the 70s. I mean, there's always been always will be. But yeah, in but the there, city, was there was disco. Oh, there he is. All right. And uh, everyone smoked cigarettes and drank during the day. Like, I, it's I just would want to be, I mean, I want to say the 60s, but I don't think so. I would actually want to be like 40s. I love the style, the dresses. Obviously, there was a lot of, I mean, terrible things happening in our country during that time. Yeah. I mean, but if yeah, we're just who knows? talking about, yeah, if you're, if you're ever level, purely. From a purely surface level, just wanting to experience the culture yeah, of that I'm time. Do you know what a better do you know what a better you know you know what a better uh, type of question to, is to that? Right. I often find I usually try to change it to say where if you could go back to any place for a week just to experience it, but then come back to the present, what would it be? Mm. And that's I think a better I think a better analogy would be to say like if it was I, just for a week, I would obviously go to the sixties. Yeah, I would I so, would go to. Maybe like I think the, I think the other thing to, I think the other thing to talk about when you talk about that but by the question by the way that is that we tend to view the past as being like novel because we see it from 2020 degrees oh, sure. and literally the year 2020 if you went back and lived there it would just be then 
It would just be like now is. Right. Someone, right. some podcaster or whatever they have in a hundred years or in sixty years is going to be like, "Hey, w- if you could go back to any decade, where would you go to?" And they'd be like, "I go back to the twenty twenties." And they'd be like, "Wow, yeah, me I don't too." Think anybody will ever because that was when the giant twenty twenty. That was when the giant. That was when World War Three happened, and it was so cool. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> God. No, but I definitely don't think that anyone would ever say, you know what? March of 2020 sounds great. Like <laughs> That would be... Yeah, just like people wouldn't be like, let's go back to 1918. Ah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. No thanks. No, thank you. Oh, man. Well, that was fun. All right. Great episode. And we will be back next week for part two. Part two. Come on and vote for Kennedy. Vote for Kennedy. Keep America strong Kennedy He just keeps rolling